Last week in the first sermon in this series called New Mercies, we looked at God's new mercy of time where, where every day God gives us this gift of, of time, of the days and the hours that we have. And, and we're called to use this gift of time well to, to love and to serve him and to, to fulfill his purposes. This week, we're going to look at God's new mercy of sanctification. And now sanctification is really just a big word that describes the process that the God undertakes uh, in his children through the Holy Spirit to make them. And, and so to make us reflect Jesus more and more. And so our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read the whole chapter, but we're really going to reflect mostly on verses one and two. And so we're going to read Romans 12 verses 1 to 21. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul begins this chapter indicating that that this begins a whole new section in the letter that he is writing to the Christians in Rome. He begins by saying, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And in that word, therefore, Paul is referencing everything that he has written in the previous 11 chapters to the Romans. Up until this point, Paul has expounded upon God's grace. He has taught us that God made himself known through creation so that all people are without excuse. He has taught us that that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And he has taught us that, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul also assures us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate God's children from his love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
And Paul makes this clear again and again that this is all because of God's grace. In chapter 12, then, what what Paul is saying in the opening verse is, is in response to all that God has done, in response to his amazing grace, offer your whole self, your whole life as a sacrifice to God. This is how we worship him. And N.T. Wright says, uh, Paul uses a vivid, indeed shocking idea. One's whole self, that's what Paul means by, my body must be laid on the altar like a sacrifice in the temple. The big difference is that whereas the sacrifice is there to be killed, the Christian's self-offering is actually all about coming alive with the new life that bursts out in unexpected ways when the evil deeds of the self are put to death. And what this offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God looks like is introduced broadly in verse two. This is where Paul gets to the work that God is doing in us through the process of, and through the new mercy of sanctification. In verse two, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so take a moment to notice the first two verbs in that verse. Now the NIV uh, translates the first verb as, as conform, but many scholars agree contrary to this translation in the, the NIV that the first two verbs in verse two are actually both passive commands. And so we should read that first one as do not be conformed. And when a command is given in the passive voice like this, it means that the action of the verb is being done to us by someone or something else. And so what Paul is saying in verse two is that as Christians, there are these forces that are acting upon us to mold our character and our conduct. And the first force that is acting upon us is the force of the world that's, that's seeking to conform us to its own image to its own way of thinking and acting and living. And so the world tells us if it feels good, do it. It tells us to look out for number one and that the truth is, is always relative. And there is this pressure on us to adopt this way of of thinking and, and living. And when Paul uses the term world, he's pointing to the things that go against God and go against his will. So he's pointing to to our sin and to our sinful nature. And so what Paul is acknowledging here is that even though we have been rescued from sin, even though we have been justified, we still struggle against sin and we must not let the ways of the world, we must not let sin shape our character and our conduct. We must not be conformed to the pattern of this world as as the world is, is trying to conform us. And the other force Uh, The one that we need to to lean into is the force of sanctification where God by the Holy Spirit acts within us to transform us by renewing our minds so that we will know God's will and we will know his ways and we will reflect Jesus more and more. Now the word that Paul uses, which is translated as be transformed is, is from the same Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis from. And that's the kind of transformation that that we should be thinking about, that we should have in mind when we think about sanctification. A metamorphosis is where an animal changes or transforms from, from one form to another, like a tadpole to a frog or like a caterpillar to a butterfly. And the change or the transformation that is occurring within us through sanctification is the change or the transformation from the old self, which is conformed to the patterns of this world, to the new self, transformed by the Holy Spirit to live as reflections of Jesus. And so what does this transformation look like? One of the first things that we have to understand about sanctification is that it is a lifelong process where God works in us through the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Jesus. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, sanctification is defined as the work of God's free grace, where we are renewed into the image of God 
and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. So in sanctification, God, through the Holy Spirit, renews and transforms us within into his image, enabling and empowering us to die to sin and to live for righteousness, enabling and empowering us to to resist sin and to reflect Jesus more and more. And so this is a process that, that we participate in as well that we are called to participate in, that we're called to walk in step with the Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit works in us, transforming and enabling us and empowering us, we're called to live out this work. We're called to live out this transformation by struggling against sin and living in ways that more and more reflect Jesus. And maybe this this story helps to illustrate the work of sanctification that God does in us and continues to do in us through the Holy Spirit throughout our whole lives. When I was in university, I drove a purple 1996 Chevrolet Corsica. Yes, and it was truly purple. Anyway, if you have ever been in a Corsica, you know that, that it wasn't a beautiful or impressive car. But it was in good condition, the one that I had. And for the most part, everything seemed to run well. And on the highway, when you punched the gas, it had plenty of power. So anyone who saw the car or who drove in the car with me would have probably said, it's a good car, even if it's purple. And it was. However, throughout my university career, my mechanic repeatedly told me a different story about my car. He noticed that that when it was cold, the engine made a bit of a knocking sound. He noticed that the radiator had a tiny leak and the brakes, well, they needed work. And I should probably, he told me, look at the shocks and the struts and, and consider doing something about that sooner rather than later. And his list went on and on from there. And so more often than I wanted to, he convinced me to bring my car into the shop to get some work done. Work that that was desperately needed, even if no one could see it yet from the outside. And that's kind of like our lives and the process of sanctification. People may see you and think they're a Christian. And they notice parts of your life that they see, that you pray before you eat, that you, you do that even at a restaurant. They notice that you're generally kind, that you read your Bible most days, that you go to church and you even listen to worship music on Spotify throughout the whole week. But God, like my mechanic, sees what's going on under the hood of our lives and all the areas that, that still need some work. He sees the judgmental attitude that we have toward others who don't think the same as us. He sees the bitterness towards that person who used to be our friend. He sees the fear when someone new, maybe even different, joins the church. And he sees the many other things inside of us that are just not right. And God tells us that this work needs to be done. Now where this analogy breaks down is that our sanctification isn't as simple as making an appointment with a mechanic. You know, we can't say, make a quick appointment to fix our anger and then three hours later, everything is good to go. Sanctification is this lifelong process of change, one where God constantly works in us through the Holy Spirit, revealing areas of our lives that need work and and transforming us within and inviting us to actively participate in this work so that we reflect Jesus more and more. I remember when my mechanic first mentioned the tiny leak in the radiator. He did a little work on it and sent me away with instructions to check my coolant levels regularly and to call him if I noticed that the coolant levels went down noticeably. He also told me that it would be a good idea to, to buy some coolant and to keep it in the trunk just in case. And this is kind of like the ways that, that we're invited to participate in our sanctification. Through the Holy Spirit, God helps us to see the areas that need work in our lives. And he sets about transforming us from the inside. 
but he also calls on us to make sure that we follow his instructions, that we live out this work that he is doing and that we keep things in check. And so, for example, if we know that our anger is in an area that needs, that needs to be fixed, if it's an area that, that God has identified as a problem and, and he's working on it, we also ought to keep tabs on our anger. And by the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us to develop some strategies to calm down when we need to. And to pray that, that God would give us the strength that we need to resist lashing out. Now, the good news for us is that this work of transformation that God is doing in us through the Holy Spirit is not something abstract and unknowable. Paul makes it clear in his instructions throughout the rest of chapter 12 and throughout the rest of his letter to the Romans, just what it is that the Spirit is doing in us and how the Spirit is transforming us from the inside, transforming our thoughts and our emotions and our habits so that we'll reflect Jesus more and more. Paul gives us a picture of what it looks like to live and reflect Jesus. And now as we read all of those commands, we're certainly aware that there is still work that needs to be done in us. And if my purple 1996 Chevrolet Corsica is any indication, every once in a while, a new problem will arise that needs to be addressed. And some problems are are so stubborn that they seem to need constant work. There are some problems that are so stubborn that will keep us going back again and again to get them fixed. I mean, we can certainly grow in our humility and our unity and our love for one another and our love for all people. And this is the reality that we live in because the world still constantly seeks to make us in its image. It still constantly seeks to to conform us to its way of thinking. And it can have a really strong pull on us. But in each of these commands that we read in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 3 and to the end, and throughout the rest of Paul's letter to the Romans, there is also the assurance and and the new mercy that, that this is the sanctifying work that God is doing in us through the Holy Spirit. This is the transformation that God is is setting about within us through the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Jesus. And so we see this picture in Romans 12 and, and, and going forward of what that looks like. And we have the assurance that That in this process of transformation and living this out, we are not on our own in this. Because God is transforming us. He is sanctifying us. And as we seek to to live this out, as we seek to walk in step with the Spirit and to cooperate with the work that the Spirit is doing in us, we do so in the assurance that, that God is always ready to strengthen us that is always ready to meet our needs so that we can reflect Jesus more and more in all that we do. And so today, let's let's pray that God would enable and equip us in more and more ways to live out our love for him and to reflect Jesus. So let's pray together. Lord, our God, we thank you that that you love us and that you have called us to be your children, that you have have forgiven us of our sins and that in this process of sanctification, that, that you are working in us to transform us from the inside. And we thank you, God, that in this work that you call us to, to participate in, that you call us to be a part of it. And so God, help us as you are working in us, help us to live out this transformation. Help us to live out these ways that you are changing us so that we can reflect Jesus more and more. And God, there are so many times where, where the world has a pull on us. And so help us to resist that. Help us to lean into this sanctifying work that you are doing in us. Help us to see the ways in which you are transforming us 
and equipping us and empowering us so that we can reflect Jesus more and more. Lord, forgive us too for the times where we haven't done that well. And by your grace and by your mercy, give us the strength that we need to live as your children, to live as reflections of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.